Now we're going to move into the, the mandibulate arthropods. Remember this, there were two big trees of evolution, the chelicerates and the mandibulates. So now we're going to have as our mouth parts mandibles. These again are going to be paired appendages. Remember that we think in the primitive arthropod or the ancestral arthropod, every segment except probably the very first one had paired appendages. And, and these paired appendages get modified to do different things. We think that the antennae are paired appendages of one of those primitive ones. And, and we talked about the chelicerae and the pedipalps. Those are paired appendages that were on the segments in the chelicerates. In this one, we're going to have the primary paired appendages are going to be the mandibles. But we'll, when we talk about these, we'll find out that there's other mouth parts there's other paired appendages that we'll talk in the insects. There's going to be a labrum. There's going to be the mandibles. There's going to be the maxillae. And the, then there'll be the labium. There, there'll be these uh, four mouth part structures. If we take a look at a crayfish or a lobster, it's got even more paired appendages there in the mouth parts. But they all have at least this one stumpy mouth part that's usually got some, some really hardened exoskeleton on the end of it, usually in the shape of teeth, which are used to bite and grind the food. Those are the mandibles. Another thing that we see in all these mandibulate arthropods is that they have a pair of antennae. And in the case of the crustacea, they have two pairs of antennae. Uh, now, next time you get that lobster, uh, and when they bring it to you, the whole lobster out, out to your dinner, Take a look at the head, and what you'll see is it actually looks like it's got three feelers or three antennae. It'll have one really big, heavy one, and then two little ones. If you follow the two little ones down, it actually joins together in one joint. So it has the second pair of antennae is what we call biramus. It has a, a branch to it, but there's really only two pair of antennae that join into the head region. The body can be divided in a whole bunch of different ways. Uh, we talked about a cephalothorax and abdomen. That's what most of the crustacea have. When you, when you take a look at a lobster, you see that cephalothorax, that's where all the legs are, and then the abdomen. Why do you need to know that? What do you eat in the lobster? The abdomen, that's where all the muscles are, okay? Oh, yes, and you, you eat the bases of the legs in the cephalothorax, and the front pair of legs, now remember the front pair of legs have big pinchers on them, but that doesn't make them pedipalps. It just makes them legs that now have pinchers on them. And so those, those big front legs are the ones that you break apart because they've got big muscles in those pincher structures or the, the chela on the front of those. We'll take a look at millipedes and centipedes. In their body arrangement, they have a head and trunk region. And in the trunk region, uh, they have virtually a whole bunch of identical segments, each with a pair of legs on them. And then finally, when we get to the insects, that's the one group of arthropods that has the true three body tag matter or three regions, head, thorax, and abdomen. Now the first group, uh, and, and I apologize, we started out just calling the, the crustacea as, as the class crustacea. But over the last few years, this has been elevated up. They say not only morphologically are they a little bit different uh, in the mandibulate group, but genetically. Uh, this divided off very early on in the arthropod evolution, and so it's been elevated up into a subphylum crustacea, and then there are classes of crustacea underneath that. So I, I apologize for kind of confusing you at, at this point in time, because we said at one time that this was the class crustacea, and now I say it's the, the subphylum. Uh, it was just easier to kind of get started without talking about all these classes of mandibulate arthropods in there uh, without confusing it. But it, it, uh, that's what the taxonomists have now done. In this case, what we see is that the mandibles have retained their chewing function. They have what is considered to be a gradual metamorphosis. Now let's talk about this. Meta means major and morph means form. So in this case, we're talking about changes in form. When we talk about metamorphosis, it's the changes in form that an animal goes through. Has the bug duck metamorphosed? Well, I haven't gone through any distinct changes, 
But I, I'm here to tell you, I don't look like I looked when I was in the bobblehead stage at six months. I don't look anymore like I did when I was in, you know, that the eight, nine, ten years old. I had hair then, okay, a little bit smaller. And then guess what happened when I was about 12, 13? I'm growing hair in strange paces. So I went through a sexual revolution. My gonads kicked in. Uh, and we've all gone through that. Uh, and so, uh, uh, again, I, I became uh, sexually mature. Now, my mother would say, I, yeah, but I didn't become mentally mature until I was about 30 or so. Um, and we're, we're now finding that out. We're finding that your brain doesn't complete its development until you're about 24, 25. Uh, things happen, and, and now I'm in that senescing stage. Okay? I'm, I'm getting old and senile, and things don't function the way they used to, and, and so forth. So, yes, I've metamorphosed. I, I, I don't look anything like I did uh, in, in my other earlier stages. We don't talk about human beings that way. Well, yeah, we do. We, we say that you're, you're a, uh, a, an infant. We say that you're a juvenile. And we say that you're a teenager and young adult and, and senior citizen and, and so forth. But that's what we're talking about here is that these crustaceans undergo, basically when a crustacean hatches out, uh, it often looks like it's going to look like when it becomes an adult, just kind of a miniature version of it or a, a smaller juvenile version uh, of that. Now, there are some ancestral crustaceans and some older classes of crustacea that, if you look at them carefully, appear to have a head and a trunk region. But the vast majority of the crustaceans that we'll a, take a look at have combined the head and the thorax into a cephalothorax, and then they have an abdomen attached to that. Most of the ones that we'll take a look at, uh, most of the extant ones uh, have variable numbers of legs, but usually uh, five to seven pairs, except for the decapoda. The decapoda are the ones you like to eat. Those are the shrimps and lobsters and, and uh, crabs and, and so forth. And if you take a look at those, they've settled on the five pairs of legs on the cephalothorax. Another important thing, two pairs of antennae. But even there, you've got to be a little bit careful because if you ever take a look at, have you ever seen the little pill bugs and sow bugs in your backyard uh, and roly polies? Those are actually crustaceans. And if you pick them up and look at them, let one walk around your hand, it just looks like there's one pair of antennae sticking out. Well, that's because the other pair of antennae have been reduced up underneath the, the head. It's still there. It's a little knob-like structure, but it's been reduced. Now, we have other what we call isopods. That's the same group as, as the sow bugs and, and pill bugs that are aquatic. And you can see that they have the, the two pair of antennae conspicuous or easy to see. All crustaceans are aquatic. Now, what's wrong with that statement? I just talked about sow bugs and pill bugs. Those are terrestrial. They don't live in the water. But they carry water around in them. And the reason why they carry water around in them is that at the bases of their legs, they have these little fleshy extensions, which are gills. They're, they're their respiratory system. When you're in water, that's great and wonderful because the water can bathe those and, and provide the oxygen and take the CO2 away. When you're out on land, that means you've got to live in moist habitats. You may have heard of land crabs. But again, land crabs can't breed out of the water. They have to return to water in order to lay their eggs and, and breathe. And, and when they're out on the land, they have to have a gill chamber that they are able to keep wet or moist in order for those to function. Now, there's a whole bunch of classes uh, of, of the crustacea, but these are the only four that we're going to have time to go over. Uh, there, there are some of these that are, are to me, really amazing and, and interesting in, in some of these other orders, but uh, we really don't have time to talk about them. What we're going to talk about are uh, two that, that you may come into contact with. Uh, these are the isopods and the amphipods. Uh, the isopods, we've already talked about, those are the sow bugs and pill bugs. And then the amphipods, if you ever go to the shore, and you get next to a pile of seaweed and all of a sudden you find some little sharp bites on your ankles, 
you're actually being bit by sand fleas. They're not fleas at all. They're actually a crustacean that has the ability to jump and, and move around very rapidly. And, and uh, while these things are, are normally uh, feeding, uh, they're sometimes called uh, uh, water scuds or sea scuds and, and so forth uh, in there. We'll take a look at another crustacean that becomes very highly modified. Uh, this is a crustacean that settles down, just like remember the the uh, uh, when we were talking about the jellyfish, the larval jellyfish settles down and, and attaches itself. Well, in, in the case of, of this, these barnacles attach themselves to some substrate, and as a matter of fact, they can attach themselves to living substrate. Have any of you seen those great blue whales that have those big tubercles and knobs on them? If you ever see that, you'll see that that's a white crusty encrustation. Those are barnacles that have actually burrowed into their skin and stay there. And, and they're hitching a ride with the whale. As the whale moves through the water, they stick their antennae and legs out and, and filter feed uh, the water. So uh, uh, they've a actually attached to a living substrate. Finally, probably the most important group to you are the decapoda. Those, those would be the ones that have the five pairs of legs, and that includes the ones we like to eat, crabs, lobsters, and shrimp. We generally consider this group uh, to, to be beneficial. Uh, and, and again, we as human beings look at this in our sort of uh, anthropocentric uh, view of the world. Uh, they're food sources for us. And, and uh, virtually every society that I know, uh, if they, they have access to the ocean, feed on crustaceans, uh, uh, crabs and shrimp and, and lobsters, things like that. Actually, you could eat those little sow bugs and pill bugs. But the problem with them, well, I'll ask you, uh, what's the thing you don't like about a lobster when you eat a lobster? What do you not want to get in your mouth? The shell. Why? When you bite down on it, it gives you this really funny crunching texture. And the reason for that, that's where the name crustacea means. Crusty means crunchy. Tacea means shell. Okay? So they have a crunchy shell. They basically have calcium carbonate deposits. That's limestone, folks, in their exoskeleton. So when you bite down on, on that exoskeleton, you crunch down on that, and you get that, that crunchy shell sensation in, in your mouth. So that's why we don't uh, typically don't like that. I'm here to tell you, uh, if, if you eat sow bugs, uh, they're pretty much probably half exoskeleton. Uh, they also have that kind of crunchy shell. Now, you'll notice that some of these can become pests when they come into to human contact. Uh, and, and what we're talking about there is, is the sand fleas can bite. Uh, and, and there are some cases where they can cause a, a pretty severe dermatitis uh, in ocean areas. Uh, more importantly, we've already learned some of this. Many of the crustacea can serve as intermediate hosts for nematodes and for flukes and tapeworms. And so if they are intermediate hosts, that means if we don't cook them correctly uh, and, and take them in, uh, we can get those parasites. Many of these are also, many crustaceans are fish parasites directly. Uh, there are some of the, the classes that we didn't talk about that actually attach to the skin of fish uh, and suck juices and blood. Uh, out of their hosts, and, and so they can be deleterious, especially in, in aquaculture or fish culture. Probably the quintessential uh, critter that's used for the crustacea morphology uh, is the lobster or crayfish. Uh, they're easy to get, uh, easy to take in the lab and, and take a look at. What I want to use this for, I don't, I don't expect you to, to know what a maxilliped and all the rest of that, uh, the terminology in here. What I want you to look at on, on this one is to take a look first. Remember the antennae that we talked about? Just like with the lobster, there's one big pair of antennae here. And then there's a biramus, smaller pair of antennae that join together to one joint at the base. So there's two pairs of antennae. 
We talked about the mandibles right here in the mouth, but I also said that in many cases there's these other parts to the mouth part, and now you're seeing them. It, it's the first maxillopad, the second maxillopad, third maxillopad, and, and so forth. The, there, there are other stru uh, structures in there. What do you think they use those structures for? Primarily chemoreception to taste what's going into the mouth and also to manipulate food particles and things that, that they get out of the water, manipulate them into the mandibles so the mandibles can chew them up and grind them up uh, in there. Then we see, uh, here's the, since this is a decapod, if we start at the back here, we can say one, two, three, four pairs of legs. Well, we know they have to have five, so that first pair of legs has been highly modified and it's got this pincher. It's a chelate leg in this case, not part of the mouth parts any longer like we saw in the arachnids, uh, part of the mouth parts. Why do they have those big pinchers on there? Now, if you've ever picked one of these up alive, you don't want it to pinch you, why? It hurts. But they're not always protecting themselves with that. What are they doing the, with those? They're catching prey and crushing it. Those are to grab a hold and damage and crush their prey. It's often in these uh, males will have bigger chelate front legs than the females do. Whenever we see that, we generally think, guess what they're probably using that for? To fight each other for territory or for the rights to a mate or something like that. And that's another common theme that, that we see in, in biology. <clears throat> Actually, I, think, I find it's really interesting. The front pair of legs is usually really large and, and chelate used to capture prey and, and crush it and, and uh, fight and so forth. But if you'll notice, the second pair of legs and the third pair of legs also have a pair of pinchers on them. In this case, they're much smaller pinchers. And if you ever see a crab or a crayfish feeding, what they will do is they'll usually grab the prey with the pinchers sort of squish it up, they'll bring it back to the hind two pair of legs, and the hind two pair of legs will feed it up to where these little maxillopeds are um, and use it to manipulate food up to the mouth, and then the maxillopeds will manipulate it uh, to make sure it gets into the mandibles and, and chewed up. Also notice that on the abdomen, uh, the abdomen is really nothing but uh, muscle bands in here. And what we'll find out is that when you disturb a lobster or a crayfish in the ocean, they get away from you by flipping that tail up underneath them and they go scoop, 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 scoop. Uh, and, and when they flip this up, that uh, the, the flap on the end of the tail there, what they call the telson and the uropods, open up and act as a big fin to scoot the water. And so they, they use that uh, to get away. Underneath those, you'll see again more paired appendages, and in this case, we call those swimmerettes. You don't need to remember that. But what these are used for, primarily, you find most of the swimmerettes more highly modified in the female. The female will often have very flat uh, swimmerettes with, with these, all these hairs on it. And what do you think that might be used for? That's to hold the eggs. Uh, the eggs are usually attached uh, to those. Other decapods that we typically deal with, uh, like I said, the, the crayfish, but the lobsters, crabs, and so forth. Oh, what's missing on that crab? What don't you see? Well, I've got the, the uh, if I look, one, two, three, four. Yeah, it seems to be missing a, a pair of legs in there. On this side, I can see one, two, three, four, five. So this one, it's missing the, the second pair of legs. I don't see an abdomen on that. All I see is looks like a cephalothorax shell on there. And that's something unique. Most of the crabs, the abdomen has been reduced considerably and it's folded up underneath the cephalothorax. Now, uh, when it comes to crayfish, uh, they may grow up down in, in the Gulf Coast, uh, down in Louisiana or any place like that uh, where, where we eat a lot of crayfish, crayfish etouffee and, and so forth. Most of the crayfish are aquatic, but there are some of them that are semi-terrestrial. Uh, and basically what they do is they make tubes underground at the water table. Why would they be at the water table? They have those gills that they've got to keep wet in order to respire. 
But uh, if you've ever gone down to the Gulf Coast, especially in Louisiana and, and East uh, uh, Texas where the, the Gulf is, when you look out on the landscape, there's all these mud tubes, what we call chimneys, that are coming up in everybody's front yard and so forth. And they can actually be a little bit hazardous if they're really made out of mud and that bakes in the sun and dries out. Uh, it can be a little hazardous to run into those things with their lawnmower uh, in there. Our next group are the isopoda. Iso means same legged. Now these are the ones that have the seven pairs of legs that, that we talked about. The, there are other ones that have more pairs of legs in it. Uh, these are the sow bugs and, and pill bugs. Uh, to me, they, they sort of look like uh, little miniature armadillos. Uh, in this case, what you're going to see is that they do have a cephalothorax. Boy, we're gonna have every sound we can have today. We have a cephalothorax that's here and the abdomen is reduced, a little tiny abdomen right here, but in the cephalothorax, each one of those segments that make up the cephalothorax has a pair of legs on it. Now, what's the difference between a sow bug and a pill bug? Uh, well, sow bugs cannot roll up when disturbed. Pill bugs have the ability to roll up, and as kids, we call them roly polies. And, and of course, the, the neighbor boys and I used to have great fun playing marbles with these. Uh, we, we'd collect them, roll them up, and then uh, flick them at, at each other and see how far they would roll before they would finally say, that's enough of that, and, and unfurl and, and so forth. Even though they have gills, uh, they can live on land. Uh, and in this case, they, that means that they need to live in places that have high moisture content or high humidity. Now, most of the sow bugs and pill bugs that we see are, are quite often considered to be scavengers of plant material, typically feeding on decaying uh, uh, plant material. But occasionally, especially if you're growing hosta plants or growing little plants in your garden and the little uh, seedlings come up that are soft and tender, these things can chew them down to the ground and, and cause real problems in some of those areas. Why do they fold up? Well, it's kind of interesting. Uh, the sow bugs have these two little tails uh, on, on the tip of it, while the pill bugs don't. And that's another feature that you can see. To me, if they're live, it's really easy. Just touch them. If they roll up, uh, they're a pill bug. But if they can't roll up, they're a sow bug. Oh, by the way, here in Ohio, when I take these to grade schools and high schools and things and open, them, open up a box of them, the kids often say, oh, potato bugs. Why? Does anybody grow any potatoes? <laughs> no, nobody grows potatoes. Well, remember in the past, the way that you grew potatoes is that you cut out the eye of seed potatoes. That means you cut out a little bit of the flesh with the little bud that's in there and planted that. So here I have this piece of potato flesh in the ground, and what's going to happen if it gets wet? It's going to rot. And remember that these like to eat rotting plant material. So I can imagine, yes, that uh, when people used to grow their own potatoes on a regular basis, uh, these could cause some real damage uh, in there before the plants really got started. Another group, just to, to kind of show you what, what I was talking about in this highly modified uh, existence are the barnacles. Now, barnacles, uh, if you take a look at it, they're actually crustaceans. They actually have their antennae <laughs> still sticking out of the stuck down part. Uh, but what they do is they actually will secrete uh, some extra calcium carbonate uh, to make these sort of bony-like plates that cover them up. And if you look at it, uh, if I flip that over, you can see where the mouth is. You could see what would be the legs in here and what would be the, the, the uh, uh, swimmerettes uh, on the, the other one. So, so they're just flipped upside down. And basically what they're using is they use their legs and, and what would be the equivalent of their swimmerettes to filter out the water, uh, filtering this uh, little planktonic material that's in the water, bring it in and shove it into the mouth uh, for digestion. So really highly modified. Oh. Did anybody else notice anything odd on this? Penis? Holy moly! That's longer than the rest of the body! 
So I have to chuckle when I hear these scientists. Human beings have one of the largest penises of all animals. Oh, come on. You're nothing like a barnacle. Now, why does a barnacle have to have such a long penis? Well, if you're stuck down, how are you going to get to the lady? you got to have something that reaches over there. Now, our last group that we're going to talk about, our groups, are going to be what we call the myriad pods. Myriad means many, poda means leg, and these are the animals that have a head and trunk region. Now, here's the, the deal. Myriapoda is not a taxonomic term. Let me repeat that. Myriapoda is not a taxonomic term. What that means is that millipedes, centipedes, and these garden centipedes actually evolve from different ancestral stocks, so they don't have a common origin. So myriapod just is a common term that's used to kind of describe those animals, those arthropods that have the head and the trunk region, the trunk having many segments and each of the segments having pairs of legs on them. Uh, but it doesn't mean that they are related to each other. Our first group will be the diplo diplopoda. What does diplopoda mean? Diplo is two. Poda is leg. What do you mean two-legged? Oh, take a real close look at this. What you'll see is that the millipedes, for every visible segment that you see, there's what appears to be two pairs of legs that come out of that. Actually, it's only one pair of legs. What's happened is for every trunk, two trunk segments there, They've joined together where the carapace of the front segment overlaps the carapace of the second. And so it looks like only one ring or one segment there, but then there's two legs that come out of that. But they're really the two legs for the, the and then when they overlap, it looks like they have two pairs of legs. Uh, again, the two body regions, the head and the trunk region. Uh, they've got one pair of antennae now. As, remember, our crustaceans had two pairs of antennae, so they've got one pair of antennae. They still have the, the chewing, mandibulate mouth parts, and there's some other mouth parts associated with that, still different than the crustacean and different from the insects. And they also have that gradual metamorphosis. And, and generally, their metamorphosis, every time they molt, they add more segments to the body and more pairs of legs to them. And the segments also get bigger and, and, and around. Millipedes come in, in uh, quite a, a few shapes and forms. Uh, some of them have perfectly round bodies. Others have these sort of lateral flaps that may uh, stick out from the, the top plate uh, of each one of the segments. But again, if you look at them very carefully, what you'll see is that here's one segment, one visible segment, and down below that we see the two pairs of legs coming out of there. Most of the, the millipedes uh, feed on molds, mildews, fungi, uh, and decaying plant material. So these would be the consummate detritivores, the, the things that, that uh, we think are, are very uh, good for us. Now, what's the difference between a millipede and a centipede? Simple. When you see a centipede, you don't see it very long because it's going to run like mad to get away from you. Millipedes, when you disturb them, usually the first thing they might do is curl up. They'll coil up into a little coil, but eventually they'll uncoil. Uh, and, and to me, they're like the, the eors of, of the arthropod world. Okay, I'm going to get out of here now, and I'll keep moving as very slowly. And, and so millipedes creep centipedes run. Now there's a good reason for this. Millipedes have their legs attached to the mid ventral line. So it's attached underneath their bodies. Uh, centipedes on the other hand have their legs attached to the sides of their segments. Now how does that help you? Well unfortunately uh, this, this used to be a really easy explanation uh, back, back in the uh, well, 70s and 80s when girls wore mini skirts. And some of you have probably seen this. Uh, some of the girls are still going back and, and wearing these little tight skirts around here. Have you ever seen them run? 
They can't because they got to go like this. Well, okay, if they really need to get away, they'll hike it up a little, and then they can take a long stride. But the reality is, is when you have your legs attached together, you can't get a long stride. It, 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 you're going to creep. But if your legs are spread apart and, and capable of, of moving rapidly, you can then run. Many of the bellipedes, again, have repugnatory glands. That means if you pick them up, uh, they might make your finger stinky again. Uh, but that's just their defensive mechanism. Uh, it's, it's not poisonous. It's not going to hurt you. Uh, it's, it's definitely not as bad as changing a kid's diaper. Uh, and, and whenever I pick millipedes up and I get that odor on me, uh, a little soap and water gets it off just fine. Like I said, there's all kinds of millipedes. There's, we actually have some fairly large ones down in the Appalachian Mountains, uh, uh, down in, in southern Ohio. Uh, there's a species down there that can get, uh, oh, three and a half, four inches long. Usually they only come out after rain. Uh, they're usually down in deep in the leaf litter, eating decaying uh, plant material and so forth. But when it rains, they go, oh, let's get up and see if we can find uh, a new place to, to feed. Here's one that you can see is rather brightly colored and, and now has sort of lateral flaps to the, the uh, uh, segments. Our next group are the chylopoda. Chylos means fang, poda means leg. That's, it's really an unfortunate name because there are some people that, uh, especially when we were in the uh, tropical uh, 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 arena during the Vietnam War, people would come back with what they called uh, uh, centipede bites. And they said, that thing bit me with all of its legs. No. And, and if you take a look at it, what you would see is a, a whole series. It, it almost looked like sutures, uh, a whole series of paired red bites from one of these. And so, indeed, it looked like it took all of its legs and dug them in. But the reality is, is only the first pair of legs have been modified into fangs. That first pair of legs fits up underneath the head. And when a millipede is, uh, is trying to subdue prey or protect itself, it will use those and, and bite. And in the case of those big tropical millipedes, what was happening is as it was running, it would go bite, 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 bite. So it was multiple bites with those fangs uh, while it was running up your, your arm or leg or something like that. One pair of antennae. Again, they're a myriapod. You can see a head and then a trunk region. And the trunk region, uh, all the segments now have one pair of legs, or what appears to be one pair of legs, attached to the side of the body. Depending on the group, uh, centipedes also, the, the, the uh, 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 we, centipede being the common name, uh, would, would mean hundred-legger. Uh, but the vast majority of, of centipedes uh, generally, uh, I think the, the biggest count, there's a ground-dwelling centipede that has like 60 pairs of legs. Uh, and, and so, yeah, that, that would be over 100. But uh, most of them uh, will have uh, about 15 pairs of legs or, or uh, smaller. Uh, all of them are predatory. That's why they've got the fang legs. It's, it's to capture other small arthropods or other small animals. We've seen these things eat lizards and birds and, and things like that. Uh, the bigger ones can bite. Typically, my, my rule is, is if, if the centipede is a, a basically more than an inch and a half in length, it probably has fang jaws or fang legs that would be big enough to pierce your skin. Uh, but again, they're usually not going to bite you unless they're restrained or, or pinned down or something like that. Uh, and, and since they're predators, they move really fast. Here's a picture up underneath the head. What you're seeing here, just a hint of the mandibles right in here, but you can see the front pair of legs, the bases of them have, have been really enlarged, really muscular, uh, and, and so that they can uh, squeeze those fangs in and, and pierce uh, the, the cuticle or the insect or the, the, uh, the skin of whatever they're preying on. One of the more icky ones that people find is the house centipede. Uh, this is a fairly common home invader. 
Uh, and what I find uh, when I mention this, a lot of the students will come to me later and say, hey, we've got that over in our apartment complex over here uh, just, just to the uh, east of campus. Uh, and they do seem to be a, a fairly common in a lot of those old houses and, and uh, apartment complexes in there. And when I tell you what they eat, these prefer to feed on cockroaches and spiders. They have a real knack for going into spider webs and capturing the spider and, and pulling out without getting caught. On the other hand, if they do happen to get one of their legs caught, guess what they do? Just like the, the, the little lizard that will lose its tail, they can self-amputate their legs. And so if the spider grabs a hold of one of their legs, they go, ah, okay, you can have that leg. And the, and the leg still has muscles in it. It'll still be twitching. And while the spider thinks it's got something, this will sneak around and bite the, the, the uh, spider and, and kill it with its fang uh, uh, poisons. Now, the reason why this is important, uh, if you see one of these running across the floor, guess what's going to happen when you whap it with that rolled up newspaper? <laughs> All the legs are going to fly off. And it just grosses people out. You'll, you'll have this twitching, writhing mass of legs sitting there, and, and it just you know, people just totally freak out uh, uh, by that. Our last one are the Simphila. I've, I've always debated whether I even should put this in here. This, this used to be a, uh, a very minor little myriapod group, and, and nobody seemed to worry uh, all that much about it. Until recently, we found out People are, are undergoing organic gardening. They're adding more compost to the soil and, and so forth. This is a soil-dwelling myriapod that feeds on root hairs, but it needs loose soil with lots of pore spaces in it for them to, to maneuver around. So again, I, I have to smile with those people that, that are deciding to go organic and added all that compost to their soil. Suddenly, they're now finding another pest uh, in, in their gardens, and, and these things uh, can feed on the root hairs of the plants and sort of stunt the roots uh, in there. Otherwise, you're never going to see them. If you'll notice, that they actually, while we call them myriapods, they don't have a pair of legs for each body segment. They've actually got a couple of the, the trunk segments that don't have a pair of legs on them, uh, and, and typically they'll, they'll only have about uh, 12 pairs of legs. Actually, when they first hatch out, they only have about five pairs of legs, but as they molt and get bigger, they add more segments and add more legs. There's no fangs. They're completely blind, but you don't need eyes if you're living in the soil where it's completely dark all the time. And, and so a, a little oddball group uh, like that. This is what they look like. Now, that symphyla in that picture is one-eighth of an inch long. So when I say these are little, tiny, white, blind arthropods, yeah, they're really small. A really big one, uh, uh, probably the biggest one I've ever seen, was a quarter of an inch long. 